So a couple years ago, maybe five, six years ago, Brian calls me and says, hey, I got this therapy that I'm using and it works by finding cellular disruption. And I'm like, what? So I'm like, I don't know what you're doing. So I said, I don't know. That sounds a little bit like a two o'clock in the morning, buy this thing and you're going to be all good. Said, no, because I'm telling you, the outcomes are incredible and patient, we're getting patients better who, you know, are reticent to care, but then the chiropractic care, not getting any responses. You got to come see it. I'm like, eh. Probably took a year to wander back up to Chicago. It was more than that. Yeah. <laughs> Probably three. Because I'm thinking, Two, well, three. he told me what it was. I'm like, well, it sounds like Russian stem. Or it sounds like a tens unit. Nah, I don't know. Probably most of the reaction you'll get today. And then it's. So finally, I got up to Chicago, spent some time with him in the office, and sure enough, he was right. The outcomes were pretty amazing. Seeing, you know, like post fracture healing, you know, times cut in half. Um, um, pretty moderate to severe injuries, ACL injuries, times cut in half. Jeez, like, I mean, they're getting people better fast. Um, I think the reason where it came from a little bit of why it was a little shaky in the beginning, that was invented by an uh, electrical engineer. Yes. Yeah. And a physiotherapist. And a, right. Neither one were doctors. Right. But had the mechanical, uh, uh, electrical brain to actually come, you know, they took direct current and they softened it. Direct current, as you guys know, kind of gets a bad rap. That's direct current. So it was in, when he first said that, I'm like, oh God, I'm not all over again. Because we've all had Russian stem and it, I mean, it hurts when it's on. So it's, it's in, and most of us have probably tried Russian stem. Yeah, it hurts. <laughs> so when he said that, I'm like, eh, you know, I don't know. And then when I, you know, I tried, tried the therapy, I'm like, well, it doesn't really hurt. I mean, I don't feel that, because Russian stem, you feel a big interface between your skin and the pad, and it actually burns a little bit. And you're like, oh God, this is horrible. So the uh, engineers, when they came up with this, they came up with they, the ability to get it up to 500 pulses per second with that machine, which is a fairly strong stimulus. Their theory behind it was the original protocol called for like a scanning. Is they, you probably remember the, high, the old high bolt where you would scan with a probe to look for trigger right. points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which wasn't a couple, which very uncomfortable. We don't really do it much anymore. You ever try that? Tell you why we don't do it. It really, really hurts to find it. So the high bolt used to have a scanner, like a metal probe, and you scan and find a hot spot or a trigger point. They were kind of doing the same thing with pads, and you would find a hot spot, and then you would put a lot of stimulus into that spot, and getting really good results with it. The problem with that was it took a long time. It took a little bit of time to do the scan, and it was very time-consuming. It was pretty Without uncomfortable question. for the patient. Um, Effective, but very time consuming. Yeah. Which is tough to run a business when it's time consuming, you know, to do that. Right. So, so I kind of kept looking at this and said, oh, good, you got it back going again. I just did. I don't, how do you make it full screen? Can't play. <coughs> Sorry, what? guys, we're running this off. Bottom. Where you see the little projector thing? Right by the right, right there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of a little bit of background on it. We're going to go much more into that, some of the physiology behind it. So I started working a lot with Brian and a lot with Jake, and Jake has a lot of experience with the, the RX, which is the bigger machine, and then the smaller ones, which are the PRS. Yeah. yeah. So this is the RX, and this is the portable PRS, and this a lot of people confuse this for a tens. It's not. <laughs> so this is at 500 pulses per second. This is at 250. Both direct current. Okay. So direct current is much different physiologically um, than alternating. And the fascinating thing, what they kind of stumbled upon, is. They're running it through a resistance capacitance circuit. Now we get a little electrical engineering geeky here. So resistance capacitance means there's resistance running through a wire, obviously, but there's also 
Capacitance is the ability to, to store energy. So when you shut your phone off, the light kind of glows for a second. <coughs> That's the capacitor's draining. So um, same with the computer. When you shut it off, the light kind of glows because you don't want to cut power right off from an electronic device like a computer because you'll lose data. So that's what capacitors were built for is to slowly trickle down the piece. The waves in here are run through resistance capacitance circuits as well. What was fascinating about that is, you know what else is resistance capacitance circuits? Neurons. Our nerves. Actually, our the same system as a resistance capacitor. We have resistance, and the resistance of a neuron is based on how many how many channels are open. Okay, so how many um, sodium ion channels open? That dictates the resistance. Then the capacitance is how much the membrane can store, because the membrane can store some charge into it. So, and that's where I think Brian and I went back and forth because he started talking about. The nerve not firing fully or firing correct, and that was always the same argument we've had in um, chiropractic for a long time, that concept of nerve interference. It doesn't really happen that way. Because any physiologist will tell you, nerves do one of two things. They fire or they don't. They're all or none, right? So you can't, like, partially fire or You can't just... If I squeeze the trigger a little bit, the bullet will just trickle up. No, it's going to fire or it won't. Now, the other aspect, though, of this is, can I change the resistance capacitance of a nerve to injury? Turns out, you probably can. So, certain firing thresholds can change. Um, the speed of the signal can change. Obviously, if I increase resistance, I increase, I decrease the speed. Okay, if I increase capacitance, speed may go down or I may lose some of the intensity of the signal because it's going towards capacitance. So that's as far as electrical engineering of the nervous system we'll get into. But they found a, a, a unique signal that can come out of the machine that mimics that. So which is probably why it's comfortable. It's different than Russian stim because it feels much more like what we normally fire. Now, the, the trick is, it's firing at a rate that's much higher than we can physically fire. We can't fire 500 pulses per second. So the brain usually operates at about, I think the last I've seen is 20. Yeah, it's like 8 to 10 is normal, but I think it can, get up can be up to 20. Yeah. Nowhere near 500. Which in a normal state, we can't get to 500 because if we got to 500, we'd be a tetany. You know, like stuck. Like Russian stem. Right. You have to fight Russian stem. Right. Right. They bent a curve with this direct current at 500 times a second that you're able to do a functional movement. Well, quite frankly, it just depends on how much stimulus you put in, but you can still be functional. Russian stem, you can't be functional at power of one or five or ten it's just how much you have to resist you know it's easy resistance so it's, it's a functional active movement you can put people through so what's interesting when you get the lab today you'll feel that when you get onto russian stim and jeremy you probably experienced that with the atc side once, Ru once russian stim sticks you into tetany you can't get out of you can't fight that like if i tell you you know okay now straighten out your bicep and it's, you're like i can't this one is going to feel like you're in tetany, but you can move it. So it's, and the muscle is going to be resisting you, but you can start to move it. Okay. So that's what the biggest difference was. So again, the kind of the time I spent at, in Chicago with Brian was like, boy, there's really something here. We got to figure this out. So for the last probably two years, we've been really playing around with what is this thing? What is this doing? And then. I've always been, my background has always been in myofascial work, a lot of the anatomy trains, the, the slings, the fascial slings, and how fascia communicates to each other, and that's always been a quandary with me and chiropractic, because they always talk about, you know, the bones move, the bones move out of place, and blah, 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 no, they don't. <laughs> they can get fixed into a plane, but they get fixed by the influence of the musculoskeletal system. 
So it's important to realize that what we're doing um, is responding to the fascial system. I mean, the biggest system in the body is the musculoskeletal system, and it, it holds a lot. You know, everything we do is to feed this system to move, okay? What we didn't realize years ago, um, well, actually the early chiropractors did, is that it also can dictate our emotional health can come through our musculoskeletal system. There's heavy kinds of psychosocial aspects. Um, the research on that is more and more becoming prevalent. Good book by an MD called The, the Body Keeps the Score. I forgot the name of the guy who wrote it. That's a great book that, that talks about how we, how somatic manifestations of psychological problems can occur. So, that's kind of how I got into the myofascial side because it's like, well, if we can't correct the pattern that's pulling me out of place, I can't correct what's going on. And if some of the students I've worked with have heard me say this a number of times, like if somebody comes in with an SI pain and you've treated that three times and it's not, you know, 30 to 50% better after three times, what's wrong? You're on the wrong spot, treating the wrong thing. That might be where the pain is, but that's not the problem. So and, you have to and if I can add to that as well, like you see, I, I use the analogy at least it's we're, you know, talking doctor to doctor type of situation, but talking to a patient. 400 pound lineman jocks to the silent. We see it all the time, blows out an ACL. Somebody tell me why. MRI says ACL is, you know, rupture, grade three. Why? Why did that ACL tear? You can't tell me he's weak, he squats 700 pounds. He didn't take a lateral hit, do a valgus stress of any sort. Why did it hurt? Why did he get that injury? And when he gets it repaired, why did he have it again? Six months later, he tweaked it again. We see it all the time. You see it on TV all the time. Talk about premier athletes. Tell me why. This can answer the question why. And what we're gonna to do today is start to look at where that comes from, you know. Now, we're gonna sadly talk about Aaron Rodgers. <coughs> But anyway. Not for me, I'm a Bills fan. No problem with that at all. <laughs> so I have to talk a little slower because he's a Bills fan. <laughs> when we look at Aaron Rodgers' injury, when you watch it on television, it's not that dramatic. I mean, he caught a shoe in the turf, but it wasn't like he hyper, you know, hyper flexed or hyper extended his Achilles. He just caught a shoe in the turf. You know, a thousand times you've done that, he's just going to pop out of that. What caused it to snap at that moment? You know, what's the biggest predictor of getting a musculoskeletal injury? What's the number one predictor that you're going to get a musculoskeletal injury? The previous musculoskeletal injury. Perfect. Which tells you what? You didn't fix the problem. We didn't fix it. Whatever we did, we didn't fix it. So, so that's where I got it a lot into the myofascial patterns and how we, how we pattern ourselves and how we walk, how we talk, whatever we're, whatever we're doing, and how that can lead to injury if we don't address this. So, you know, hopefully today when you leave today, you'll realize that I don't care if you come in with ankle pain or wrist pain, there's a common pattern I'm gonna run you through to figure out where this is coming from and treat that area. So, a lot of times, you know, if someone's coming in for ankle pain and all you did was treat their ankle, you did a quarter of the job. You know, same with wrist pain. If they came in with wrist pain, all you did was treat the wrist, you never went up past the elbow, you didn't do your job. Because I'm gonna tell you, guaranteed it's gonna come back, or something else will come back. And hopefully you'll see that today. And that's where, I think the huge advantage of, uh, we have at chiropractic is that approach, that we're not looking at just the problem. You know, where does this come from? You know, we're pretty, the only profession that does that. Pretty much. 100%. Yeah. Everything else is symptom. What's your symptom? I have an answer. It goes with this. That injury, this. We look at the causation of why somebody is dysfunctional. Right. This takes it to a different level. It makes it a little bit easier to figure out 
what it is. So as chiropractors, what's their main mode of treatment? Manipulation. That's one, but what's their main broad bucket of how we treat? So uh, MDs are typically? Pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical or chemistry. It's, they're gonna affect your homeostasis through some kind of chemical intervention, typically, with a pharmaceutical. Not saying that's good or bad. No, you need them sometimes. Right? But it's a different approach. And the fascinating approach is how complex the body is, because just watch a pharmacy, just watch a commercial today on a pharmaceutical and the 60 different lists of the side effects, because not one thing affects one thing in the body. We all know that. So again, I have nothing against pharmaceuticals at all. They're lifesavers. They can be. They can help a lot of people live better lives. But that's not our approach. What's our approach? So there's this chemistry. Yeah, and then you can say they're holistic because they give you natural pharmaceuticals. So. Manual therapy. Physical. Manual therapy, physical. You guys are getting close to it, but what's our main intervention? Sensory input. So you can say that to any chiropractor in the world, that, and they can't argue, our main way we treat is sensory input. Whether that's a manipulation, an acupuncture needle, massage, soft tissue, fascia work, electrical stem, ultrasound. It's all affecting the sensory side of the system. What's the strongest sense, one of the strongest sensory tools we have? Touch. Touch and? Smell. Smell strong. Hearing. What I say to you? Hearing. Remember, our words are really strong sensory input. How many times have you had this gotten, you guys have been in practice a while, how many times have you heard this? I can't do that, my knee's bone on bone. The worst thing you could ever tell a patient. Because if you never told them they had bone on bone, they would try it. Because they don't know they have bone on bone, but now they have bone on my 